A federal judge has ordered former Trump 2016 campaign chairman Paul Manafort to appear in court tomorrow morning to face allegations from Robert Mueller's team that he repeatedly lied to investigators and broke a plea deal. But Manafort's attorney is rejecting the claims that he lied. Manafort pleaded guilty to obstruction of justice, among other charges, last September. We'll keep you posted as that goes forth in court. Fox News alert now. That mean for our ties. He has issued a subpoena for Michael Cohen compelling him to appear before the panel in mid-February. Tina's Michael Co one day after the president's former attorney decided to delay his appearance before a House committee due to what he called ongoing threats from the president and his legal team. Cohen's attorney called on lawmakers to take action. Watch it. The House of Representatives now has an obligation, a resolution of censure when the President of the United States indisputably intimidates and obstructs justice to prevent a witness from testifying is an order. So is a federal criminal investigation of Rudy Giuliani for witness tampering, calling out a man's father-in-law and wife in order to intimidate the witness is not fair game. Catherine Herridge is live in Washington with more on this. Catherine, good to see you. Well, thank you, Harrison. Good afternoon. The subpoena from the Senate Intelligence Committee is significant because it may be the only congressional Russia investigation left on the Hill that continues to have bipartisan support. Their work has had a singular focus on Russian interference and the intelligence implications rather than the politics. The Senate committee, led by Republican Chairman Richard Burr and ranking Democrat Mark Warner, issued the subpoena this morning, according to Cohen's attorney. As you mentioned yesterday, Cohen's team canceled testimony in the House for the first week of February. The Democratic chairman of the House Oversight Committee said no witness should be threatened or intimidated if that's what happened. And he said his committee will get answers from the president's former personal attorney. I promise you that we will hear from Mr. Cohen. Now, we will make those determinations uh, soon and we will let you know how we plan to proceed. But we will we will get the testimony as sure as night becomes day and day becomes night. Responding on Twitter before the Senate subpoena was public, the president called Cohen a bad lawyer, quote, who sadly will not be testifying before Congress is using the lawyer of crooked Hillary Clinton to represent him. Gee, how'd that happen? The president also told reporters that the alleged threats are not credible. He says he's been threatened by, by you and uh, uh, Mr. Giuliani, he and his family have been threatened. No, I would say he's been threatened by the truth. He's only been threatened by the truth. And uh, uh, he doesn't want to do that probably for me or other of his clients. Uh, he has other clients also, I assume. And uh, he doesn't want to tell the truth for me or other of his clients. The Senate subpoena sets a target date of mid-February, and here the timing uh, really does matter because it's coming just two weeks before Cohen is set to begin mm -hmm. uh, that three-year prison sentence, Harris. Yeah, March 6th. Uh, Catherine, thank you very much. Joining well. me now uh, for more on this is Laura Trump, senior advisor for the Trump 2020 campaign, also the wife of Eric Trump, the president's son. Good to see you. I haven't thank seen you, you in the new year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thanks for being here. Let's start with Michael Cohen. Uh, the one thing that I would say would be helpful would see maybe some evidence in all of this, of these threats. So what is the talk uh, within the inner circle of the president about this? Well, I mean, you heard from the president. This is so ridiculous. And I think it's very evident to so many people now, Harris, that Michael Cohen is a desperate man. He has he holds no water as, as far as anything concerned with the truth goes. He's perjured himself in the past. Maybe he doesn't want to go uh, out and, and testify again because maybe that's going to happen to him another time. Um, he he probably is scared of the truth because he knows, just like the president does and like we all do, that there there is nothing there. Everything is baseless as it surrounds Michael Cohen. So uh, it's sort of sad to see this, but unfortunately not surprising. Yeah, and the president himself, when I sat down with him a few weeks ago, when I asked him, why did you bring a man like this uh, into your inner circle and, and would have so much power surreptitiously recording you? And he said he made a mistake. Yeah. Uh, it was over some real estate deal that they had done on a committee and uh, so on and so forth. But, um, you know, we just heard from the Senate Intel Committee Vice Chair Mark Warner now on the Hill, Democrat from Virginia, telling our producers when asked, uh, 
about this Michael Cohen situation. What do you want to hear from Michael Cohen? And Warner said he lied to the committee. He has enormous number of unanswered questions about Trump Tower and a variety of other items that we'd be interested in. What's your reaction? Well, I'm not sure what anyone thinks Michael Cohen has. Again, he hasn't been very truthful with much in the past. Maybe he's he's lied about things. I, I don't I don't really know. But what I can tell you is it, he really is is a little bit hard to take these days. I think that most people on both sides of the aisle don't give him a lot of credibility. So mm. I, I'd kind of be curious to hear what he has to say. And I, I think the president would as well. You know, uh, I, I do want to talk about just where we are in the investigation and, and Bob Mueller and Michael Cohen and his part of it. He goes to prison on March 6th. He slid the date from February 7th. And now the Senate intel has stepped in and said, no, 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 you will be heard from and it'll be the middle of February. But what we do know is that there was a potential to mitigate his sentencing, perhaps. And what does this do for that? I mean, I'm very curious to see. I think he's probably looking for anything he can at this point, Michael, Michael Cohen, to lessen his sentence. Maybe he thinks this this could possibly be helpful for him. If he's if he's got anything that that people want to hear, maybe they'll say, well, he cooperated with us. Let's lessen his, his jail sentence. I don't really know. As far as I have known about Michael Cohen, he doesn't know a whole lot about anything. There was nothing nefarious. Well, the president says he was a bad lawyer. And there was nothing nefarious that ever happened as it, as it relates to Trump Tower, to Russia, to any of these things. And and everyone on the Democrat side is salivating, hoping that there is well, something that Michael has. I don't think he's he got He got anything. the world's attention with recordings of the president, and you go from there. I, I want to mention something to you and get your response to it. There has been, as you know, a lot of blowback on some words that you had to say with regard to the shutdown and those people who were working without paychecks. And some of them have been deemed unessential, so they're not even on the job, right. which, is, which is hard, too, yeah. because you hope you can protect your job by being there. It's stressful. It can raise your credit limit if you miss a mortgage payment. It can make your life hard. And in terms of getting clearances if you work for the government and need one in the in the future what did you mean to say when you said that people were hurting a little bit, just a little bit of pain. Well, first of all, this is a classic example, Harris, of exactly what happens with the mainstream media. If anyone bothered to watch the entirety of this I interview watched the I whole did, thing. I think it was very clear. I am incredibly empathetic towards anyone right now who is struggling without a paycheck, without several paychecks, who have families, who have mortgages, bills to pay. I, I think that it's it's got to be incredibly tough for them. But my whole point was that the president is standing strong on his position because this is really about the future of our country, about you, fixing that immigration system. Uh, Laura, you issued a statement. Yes. You, you felt like you needed to do that. Yeah. And uh, what was the statement and what do you think you corrected? Well, I just want people to know out there that the, the mainstream media is very disingenuous. They took a couple of words that I said out of what was a completely legitimate and acceptable statement that I had to say about, and by the way, I thank the workers. I think that they're, they really are sacrificing right now, and we understand that. I think America yeah, you said understands that. They should that. be thanked for their sacrifice. They really should. And and for for the mainstream media to take one little blurb out of what I said, misconstrue it, and misrepresent what I had to say is completely unacceptable. And it's why the president calls the media a lot of fake news these days. That is the exact thing. Um, I I have a, a lot of respect for for anyone who is a government worker who has not been paid, who is trying to make ends meet right now. And the fact that anyone would portray me in any other light, I found very upsetting. So I wanted to set the record straight. I That is not in my character to do something like that. And and it was it was really hard to see all these people attack me over something that, that was misconstrued. Well, and it also reflects just how much people are hurting in a wide stance and their, and their points of view right now. Thank you. Thank you for, very much. For issuing that response as well yeah. on camera and in person. Sure. Laura Trump, thank you. Thank you. All right, the White House is setting the stage for a second summit between President Trump and Kim Jong-un after two leaders exchange letters now whether the president should delay that summit until North Korea gets serious about denuking. The White House is confirming President Trump has responded to North Korea leader Kim Jong-un's letter that was hand-delivered to him last week. Meanwhile, 
Kim Jong-un has praised President Trump for his, quote, unusual determination and will to settle their nuclear arms dispute with a second summit, also saying he would move step by step to achieve his goal in negotiations with the U.S. However, just last week, Vice President Mike Pence admitted that not much progress has been made toward denuclearization. Bringing in now General Jack Keane, Fox News senior strategic analyst and retired four-star general. Uh, general, great to see you. Yeah, Thank you for being you, here. All right, so when Kim Jong-un talks about what his goal in negotiations are, what is that? Yeah, well, that's interesting, and, and I'm delighted you're asking that. Here's what he wants. First of all, he, he wants all U.S. troops out of South Korea. He wants major sanction relief and some indication of that at this summit. He wants nuclear weapons that the United States has in the region removed from the region. And he also wants the armistice to end. In other words, the North Korea-South Korean war to end and a peace treaty be signed. That's kind of what he's, what he's really interested in. And I think the immediate goal he has, Harris, is sanction relief. And of course, that is the pattern that our previous presidents all were involved in with him, mm -hmm. or his grandfather, or his father. And that was, we promise to denuclearize, mm -hmm. but you have to remove the sanctions. And that has happened every time. So I, I know that we have spoken before, and others have told me too, that it is a good thing to keep the communication lines going. When does the communication line, though, get frustrated by the fact that we are legitimizing him on a world stage? Well, I think we're past it. I mean, we did legitimize him on a world stage at the last summit. I, I, was, I would have preferred the president not to go to this summit and until the first such time. One. This one. So this how one. do you feel about a second one? Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm talking about, the summit that's coming now. I, I would mm -hmm. have preferred if he used that as leverage to gain concessions from Kim Jong-un. But he's already committed to the, to the summit. Here's the, one of the issues, I'm, and I'm hoping that there's, I take the president at his word. He said there is more going on between North Korea and the United States than what is being reported in the media. What could that be? Likely, if there is something positive, we have been trying to get an inventory of their weapons and their ballistic missiles mm. right from the first meeting, and they have never provided it. That is a possibility, and if that has occurred, that's a major step forward. Now, we know where a lot of their weapons and missiles are, but we don't know where all of them. But if we looked at an inventory list, we would have some, be able to make a judgment about it as to its accuracy. All right, you're giving me the list of what we want. We want that weapons and missile uh, inventory. What else do we want? Well, the, the core issue is disarm, dismantle nuclear weapons and biological and chemical weapons, and also either move the ballistic missiles out of the country or disarm them and destroy them. He wants all U.S. troops out of South Korea. Is there anything on his list that you think we would give him? I think we'll eventually give him the, the treaty. Oh, and, well, and in the, the armistice and, yeah, and, and, yes. and the war. But that's good for everybody. Yeah, and the, the reason why we haven't done that is because the next shoe to fall will be China's pressure mm -hmm. and South Korea's pressure to move the troops out because the armistice has ended. Uh, General Keene, we'll bring you back. Thank you so very yeah, much good talking, for Harris. being here. Uh, we are awaiting two votes in the Senate. Dueling bills to end the partial government shutdown. Both are expected to fail. We were watching the action that you see on the Senate floor. And can lawmakers break the stalemate? Power panel will slide in as the news breaks on this. Stay close. Alert, fewer than 90 minutes from now. The Senate is expected to hold votes to advance competing bills to end the government shutdown. This is Outnumbered Overtime. I'm Harris Faulkner. A lot happening this hour. Lawmakers are set to consider President Trump's proposal and a Democratic bill, which are both expected to fail at this point. The main sticking point continues to be border wall funding. Meanwhile, a group of moderate blue Democrats, blue dog Democrats, as they called themselves, are calling for House and Senate leadership to hold a bipartisan bicameral summit designed to produce legislation to end the partial government shutdown. Quote, both parties must come together to end the brinkmanship and reopen the government and then follow up with a long-term bipartisan solution that ensures strong, effective border security. We came to Congress to represent our constituents and they are demanding action. We can and should respond accordingly. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel is live for us on Capitol Hill. So, is there any sign of movement at this hour? 
No, there are a lot of folks looking for a deal, Harris, but they're going to go through these votes to start. Majority Leader Mitch McConnell needs at least seven Democrats to support President Trump's package, and he is selling it. Members can vote to immediately reopen the entire government with a compromise package that the president will actually sign, or they can hold out for the Democratic leader's dead-end proposal that stands no chance of earning the president's signature and ending the partial shutdown. Senate Democratic Leader Chuck Schumer favors the other plan, the second one senators will vote on today. It would reopen the government for two weeks and would not include border wall funding. Today, West Virginia Democrat Senator Joe Manchin told us he's a yes on both bills. I want to move this forward. This is ridiculous. stuff. If people would take the time and go and talk to the, to the federal employees in their states and find out the hardships we put them in, this is all man-made. And this is turning not only into a catastrophe, it's turning into an emergency. On the House side of the Capitol, Speaker Nancy Pelosi is urging senators to support the Democrats' plan, two weeks of government funding for the agencies that have been shut down for 34 days. There's no excuse for Senate Republicans not to pass this legislation. We've asked them over and over again to take yes for an answer. So we're very firm in our support on how we secure our borders. Let's have that discussion after we open up government and then let us get to work. A leading House Republican is saying it is time for Democrats to have an intervention with Pelosi. It is absolutely untenable and unreasonable for them not to even come to the table. Uh, and I really hope that the Democrats will recognize soon the damage that uh, Speaker Pelosi is doing to their party, that she's doing to uh, this institution, that she's doing to the, to the House of Representatives and to the United States. Many lawmakers on both sides sound hopeful that after today's votes likely fail, that that will produce serious talks leading to a deal. Harris. All right, Mike, thank you very much. Republican Senator John Thune of South Dakota, uh, the Senate Majority Whip, is now with me now. And, of course, one of the main uh, things that your job as whip uh, that's on your list of things to do is to whip the votes. Where are we? What can pass in the Senate at this point? Two different types of bills to reopen the government. Right. Well, let's hope, uh, Harris, that there'll be the votes to pass the president's proposal. It's a fair and reasonable proposal. It's made in good faith. The president has uh, shown his willingness to compromise and to put forward a plan that addresses a lot of the Democrat concerns, that reopens the governments, get fed gets federal workers paid again, and addresses the crisis at the border. So we'll see where the votes are this afternoon. And uh, like I said, I'm hopeful that we'll see some Democrats that will con conclude that the best way to get the government open again is to, to vote for this uh, amendment. Senator Thune, I would imagine you know that there's some things that are changing on your side of the political aisle in terms of the votes that you're probably whipping uh, for policy on your side. Uh, Senator Cory Gardner now on a list of three GOP senators who say that they will vote for both bills. And on the list, if we put it up on the screen here, uh, Senators Gardner, Collins, and Murkowski, and then one Democrat, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, saying that they'll vote for both. Does that reflect that they are moderate or that they cannot commit one? one way or the other, yes or no, on the wall, because these bills are split that way. One has wall funding, one doesn't. Right, and I think that every senator obviously has to, you know, determine what's in the best interest of the people that they represent in their state, Harris. But again, if you if you want to have a piece of legislation that reopens the government, ends the shutdown, gets uh, federal employees paid again, addresses the wall issue, provides supplemental assistance to those areas that have been hit by disasters, the proposal put forward by the president, and addresses a number of the Democrat concerns when it comes to the DACA population and the TPS population, uh, that's the only bill that does that. What the Democrats are putting forward is a short-term continuing resolution that takes us through February 8th, but doesn't do any of those other things. So it's, it, you know, to me, we have a clear choice today. Uh, people are going to be, be able to go on the record, and we have individual senators, as you, as you said, who've indicated that they will vote to reopen the, the government, no matter mm -hmm. what form that takes. Um, and that's just something that, uh, as we get into these votes this afternoon, we'll get a better sense of where people why, are at. Why do you think the list of, of GOP senators is growing? Anything it takes will vote for both uh, just to get the government to reopen. What, what are they looking at? 
Well, I think there's just a frustration overall that this, you know, this is dragging on, and obviously it has very, very human, very real personal impacts on yes. people. But in, in the end, it's I think it's that, and in uh, a concern that uh, we're not getting to a solution. And I think most of our members want to get to a solution, and we're offering that today. And hopefully, uh, there'll be yes votes for that. Let's take a look at, at what some people are dealing with. Fifty-four percent of them say that they couldn't miss more than two paychecks without having trouble paying their bills. And actually, when we pop that up on the screen what you're going to see is that uh, some people couldn't miss even one. Twenty percent of them said no paychecks missed and they, they'd uh, have trouble in this scenario. But you add all that up and things are getting dire. Uh, so, so what has to happen today if both of these bills fail? Well, obviously, a, a negotiation that gets us to an outcome or gets us to a result. Um, but you have described, and of course, we're all hearing that from people back home. Uh, these effects are very, these impacts are very real. 50% um, of American people live paycheck to paycheck, and I'm certain that's true for those who are federal employees as well. And so we've got to get this solved. But, you know, again, we're offering people an opportunity. If Democrats want to reopen the government and end the shutdown and get federal employees paid again, they have an opportunity to do that today. All they have to do, plus get other things that they want in terms of priorities for immigration. All they have to do is give the president some money for uh, border security. And I think that's a fair trade. The administration has moved. The president has been willing to compromise and be flexible. Democrats have not. So Democrats are saying uh, there have been reports that House Democrats are looking at a border security uh, rather than mentioning the wall at all money for that. And then I would say, could you even go further and, and put a date certain in there where you talk about it um, and let the experts, the analysts, tell you what to do and how to spend that money? Quick last word. Sure. I think that we ought to listen to the experts and they'll tell you that you need a wall in certain places. Right. And that's something the Democrats have not been willing to entertain. All right. Senator Thune, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks, Harris. We hope the best for the nation as you guys go forward. Uh, new questions about the potential impact of the partial government shutdown on airline travel. The leaders of three unions representing pilots, air traffic controllers, and flight attendants have released a statement saying they find it, quote, unconscionable that workers are being asked to continue to work without pay in an airline safety environment that is deteriorating by the day because of this. They warn, quote, in our risk-averse industry, we cannot even calculate the level of risk currently at play nor predict the point at which the entire system will break. It is unprecedented, end quote. But an FAA spokesperson has told Politico travelers can be assured that our nation's airspace system is safe. Fox News alert. New reaction from House Speaker Nancy Pelosi now. After President Trump has postponed his State of the Union address, the president, instead of choosing to deliver it once the government reopens, is what he's saying, after Pelosi rescinded the invitation to speak on the House floor next week. Pelosi today calling the president's decision the right thing to do. Last night, the president accepted the fact that uh, the State of the Union should be at a time, the State of the Union just should be at a time when we can talk about the State of the Union when government is not shut down. It is so unimportant in the lives of the American people in terms of especially those who are uh, uh, victims of the shutdown, hostages to the president's applause line in a campaign speech. White House correspondent Kevin Cork now on the North Lawn. Kevin? Harrisley, back and forth over the State of the Union is sort of a fitting reflection of the ongoing rancor here in the nation's capital. Back and forth we go with no apparent end in sight. The president, as you pointed out last night on Twitter, made it clear, yeah, he's going to postpone, at least for now, his address to the nation. Let me share part of that tweet. Uh, I thought it was interesting, too, because what he really did was he listened to the speaker, at least in part. He said, okay, as the shutdown was going on, Pelosi asked me to give the State of the Union address. I agreed. She then changed her mind because of the shutdown suggesting a later date. It's her prerogative. I will do the address when the shutdown is over. I am not looking for an alternative venue for the State of the Union address because there's no venue that can compete with the history, tradition, and importance of the House chamber. I look forward to giving a great State of the Union address in the near future. But on Capitol Hill, an emboldened speaker said today, despite White House reports to the contrary, she's not opposed to talking to the president, but she will not make a deal so long as the government is shut down. It's the president of the United States. We, we meet with him any time he wants to meet, and I've never discouraged anybody from meeting with the president. 
White House officials, meanwhile, Harris remind us that it was Pelosi who said even if the president opens up the government, she will not give him border security funding that includes money for a barrier or a wall. The president says she's playing politics because she knows when it comes to securing the border, the majority of the American people are on his side. The State of the Union speech has been uh, canceled by Nancy Pelosi because she doesn't want to hear the truth. She doesn't want the American public to hear what's going on. And she's afraid of the truth. Nancy Pelosi's become a nightmare for the Democratic Party. She seems unreasonable. She seems to have a dislike for the president that is hurting the country. Uh, and this idea of not letting the president speak is really overplaying your hands. That's the real question. Will this happen now in the future? Say a Democrat is in the White House and Republicans control the House. Unintended consequences. We'll have to wait and see. No public events, by the way, scheduled today for the president. Should he remark on the votes on Capitol Hill? I promise to share it with you. But for now, back to you. Kevin Cork, thank you very much. I want to bring in Democratic Congresswoman Debbie Dingell of Michigan. She is the co-chair of the House Democratic Policy and Communications Committee. Uh, I, I had hoped at this point, since you and I last talked, we would have moved the ball farther a little bit. But I, I want to tell everybody, you are working with a Republican, uh, Congressman Fred Upton of your state, to do some things for people who are without paychecks right now. I want to just start there and the pressure that is on both sides of the political aisle now to reopen the government. Well, first of all, I'm working with more than just Fred. I think that there are many people on both sides of the aisle that understand how much these public servants are suffering out there. They're not Democrats or Republicans. They're people that are trying to do their job. And when you realize that there are essential employees from TSA to FBI to Secret Service to the Coast Guard to the Custom and Border Patrol that have been working 33 days without being paid, the stress that that is taking on them is just inexcusable. Our governor from Michigan and several other governors have been trying to put their finger in holes and trying to help people and it turns out you can't apply if you are someone living paycheck to paycheck and there are more people in this country doing that than people yeah, realize. We just had a poll that showed that. Uh, I, I want to talk now, let's move it forward to the State of the Union address and what has transpired in the last few days with this. Uh, another Fox News poll asks, should the president, what should he do about the State of the Union speech, deliver as usual 56%? People want to hear from the president, um, primarily because of some of the issues that you just laid out and what is his vision going forth. Uh, where is the conversation in the House right now in terms of what would pass to reopen the government? If it's it's just border security and wall comes about as part of the discussion with that per the experts is that something that you think could pass the house I think that what people want is what Speaker Pelosi has said, and actually I've heard Republicans and Democrats say, let's okay. reopen the government. Right, okay, six, we got that. Th but so what? get that. So I think if we can get in a room and have a discussion about border security, that you would be surprised at the amount of money people are willing to put into border security, and it would contain many things. We need the experts in the room, and we need more custom and border patrol if there are places that some kind of barrier should be part of it, that that's part of it. Drones, technology, all kinds. We need technology that's going to... So can I the, ask you a uh, question? I, and, and I respect <coughs> the experts both on the Border Patrol, DHS, all those people who would come forth and say uh, as... Uh, Representative Garamendi and others have told me on the program who are within your party that it's a three-pronged thing. It's a barrier. It's people. It's technology. Um, but, you know, the American people have spoken about this. And when you look at the polling on who supports the wall, uh, just in terms of some of them say that the shutdown isn't worth it. Seventy-one percent of them say that per a CBS yeah. poll. But, but just the idea that there should be some sort of barrier along with the 600 plus miles we already have, maybe another couple hundred miles of it. You wouldn't call the American people necessarily experts, but they have voiced their opinion on that. They, they do back the, the president on that. So you want to keep them in the conversation, too. So when Nancy Pelosi says not a dollar for the wall, where does that leave you all? I think we're going to get in the room, and I think, you know, the fact of the matter is, you can't even put a wall across the total geographic space well, no, that of people course are not. talking about. Of course not. You can't. So Nobody I think says that, that you can. It, it, you get the experts, and you get Lucille or Allard, other ch chairs and members of this committee, with Republicans in the room, House and Senate, and say, I don't think there's anybody. I've said this to you When before, do you want Harris. to do that? I want to do it now. You want to <laughs> do it before the government, the government is open? You just want to go get that done? 
I just want people to talk to each other because people wow. are suffering. We've got to, and I know people want to have the conversation, but people, there are people that say we shouldn't be holding these public servants hostage, and I happen to agree with that. But we got to have this dialogue. Compromise isn't a dirty word. You know, I think that. But right. I want to keep this country as safe as anybody else wants to keep this country safe. Well, wow. that I sounds also like common wanna... ground with the president and the Republicans right there. Congresswoman Dingell, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Take Fox care. News alert now. The Senate Intelligence Committee has subpoenaed former Trump attorney Michael Cohen to testify in mid-February. This after he postponed his appearance next month, citing what he claimed were ongoing threats to his family by President Trump and his legal team. Earlier today, when asked if Cohen would comply with the subpoena, his attorney said they had not decided yet. We'll keep you posted. Fallout continues after that viral confrontation in Washington, D.C. last weekend. The Native American activist involved now is speaking out. What he's saying about that encounter and his reaction to the Kentucky teenager who is also publicly responding. Who's... <laughs> The Native American activist whose confrontation with a Catholic high school student went viral is now speaking out about the incident you see playing out previously. That video shows Nathan Phillips singing and playing a drum while standing face to face with student Nick Sandman as two rallies converged in D.C. last weekend. Nathan Phillips says he forgives Sandman but calls his public apology insincere. What it says is he has a PR firm, so those aren't even his words if he has a PR firm. Even though I'm angry, I still have that forgiveness in my heart for, for those students. And that forgiveness even goes to those chaperones and those teachers who should have who should have just said, you students, this isn't the place. I would ask Mr. Phillips why he did not walk away, but we'll move on. Sandman has said he meant no offense, but admitted that in hindsight he wishes he would have walked away and avoided the incident altogether. At BuzzFeed, that's the digital publishing company uh, that will slash about 15% of its workforce, nearly 250 jobs due to financial issues. This report comes just days after the special counsel Robert Mueller disputed BuzzFeed's report claiming President Trump had directed Michael Cohen to lie to Congress about a Moscow Tower project. Mueller's team said the article by BuzzFeed was inaccurate. Investigators searching a Kentucky home this week in connection with the disappearance of a young mom last seen nearly three weeks ago. Surveillance video captured Savannah Spurlock leaving a Lexington bar with two men, both of them questioned and have been released. Still no sign of Savannah. Matt Finn is following the story from our Midwest newsroom. Matt? Harris, Savannah Spurlock is the mother of four children, including seven-week-old twins. And the father of those twins tells Fox News he thinks that the two men Savannah was seen last on surveillance video with knows what happened here. The surveillance video shows Savannah Spurlock with two men leaving a pub in Lexington called The Other Bar on the morning of January 4th. Police question those men, but so far, no arrests. Savannah's mother and ex-boyfriend say they do not know who these men are. Police say this is a very active, high-priority investigation but so far have not released what they might have discovered in the search of that home and car. A local report indicates that one of the two men on that surveillance video live at this house that was searched. Savannah's mother tells Fox News that she is living a nightmare. Her daughter seldom goes out to bars and that night just wanted to have a drink or two with friends. Savannah is described as good-hearted, very reliable young mother who was always in touch. Here's a portion of a video released by Savannah's aunt. Waiting is hard, not knowing answers to questions is hard when you're a stranger and you're passionate about this story. When you're living it and breathing it, it can be crippling. Savannah is described as about five feet tall. She currently has brown hair and a rose tattoo on her left shoulder. Harris. Matt Finn, thank you very much. The president of Venezuela has kicked out American diplomats after the United States took a stand with his opponent and all those people you see marching in the streets against the socialist policies there. So what will that mean for our ties with that troubled nation? Plus, a Senate committee subpoenas Michael